Welcome to the Science of Baking class. During this class, we are uh, going to be meeting Monday through Thursday for the next four weeks. And uh, this PowerPoint is your introduction to the class. Um, so let's get started. Welcome to the course. Uh, we do hold this class Monday through Thursday, and it is going to be held in a hybrid format, uh, meaning your lectures <clears throat> will be online and your class sessions will be in person, your lab sessions. Uh, so daily lecture will be located under the course content ta in uh, Talon, and you need to log in every day before the class begins and review the PowerPoint, just like you're doing right now. Um, most of the time, I will narrate them and take you on through them. But on the other hand, there are some that just require that you review the PowerPoint and uh, look it over to prepare yourself for the lab. Now, you are registered for either the 7 o'clock lab or the 9 o'clock lab, depending on when you registered. Um, we'll be holding that lab in the bakery lab. So when you come to the lab session, you're going to be coming just to the lab session. You won't be coming to lecture because you will have already done that here on Talon. In most days, um, we're going to be working in the PowerPoint to develop a hypothesis that sets the stage for lab activities of the day. And the rest of the lecture will be on Talon so that you can go through uh, the material. And we will then present what we're going to be doing as an experiment in our lab session. So. What we do with that hypothesis, as the scientific method dictates, is that we're going to be checking the hypothesis with an experiment. Uh, we're going to verify it, test it, visually evaluate it, taste the product we make, and you'll be documenting your results on a lab form, a lab, lo a lab log form. Um, those you'll be handing in, and you'll be graded on those. Now, the emphasis in this class, it's, it's really a science class. That's the thing. It's like taking any science class. Um, but the big difference here is that we're using food as our primary focus. So the emphasis is on baking. And we're going to be using baking to test our experiments. And our experiments, a lot of times, will be about trying out uh, different methods that are classic in baking to see if they work, to intentionally sometimes uh, mess things up to see what happens. and. Um, in that way, it's it's going to be a uh, very much a science class. We're going to be uh, doing things a little differently than other science classes, though. It's not just one type, one particular type of science. Some of it deals with biology, some of it deals with physics, some of it deals with chemistry. Um, but the point is, is that we're going to be become better bakers because we understand what's going on inside of our baked product as it's being made. So we're better at our craft and better at what we do. So the syllabus is on Talon, and you will see in the syllabus that lists a whole list here of, of real, really kind of goals um, and objectives for the class. Um, and you can see evidence of problem solving and, sci and scientific skills. Being able to take that scientific method and apply it, working cooperatively and effectively as part of a team. Um, our classes split the semester into smaller groups, so you'll be about five or six people in the lab at the time. But really, when we work cooperatively, it's going to be mostly when it comes to cleaning up the lab. So we're really going to have to work as a team because we do have a small group, and it takes a small group a little longer to do cleanup. So if we work clean from the very beginning, um, we won't have as much to clean up. Um, acquire and refine our sensory skills and our technical skills for baking. Uh, being able to evaluate food uh, objectively. That's another goal of this class. And being able to take a look at bakery recipes and really analyzing what's going on in the recipe um, to determine whether it was written correctly, whether it was written incorrectly. Really, when it comes down to it in this class, you're going to grow as a self-learner. What that means is that you're going to take responsibility for your own learning and be able to uh, get excited about what you're learning. Um, to be a better, better at your craft, better at what you do because you understand it rather than just following a recipe. And then being able to practice uh, written and oral communication skills in lab reports, being able to document what you do. After all, 
if we make a mistake, we need to be able to, if we make some mistake or we, we uh, uh, stray from a recipe, we need to remember why things happen and being able to document things makes a big difference. So it's gonna be very important for us in the future when you say, well, that cake collapsed, why did it collapse? Well, let's document that. And then you can remember why that happened so you can prevent or at least reduce the chances of it happening again. So our working expectations. Um, my expectations of you is you come to class prepared. Um, your personal mise en place is your responsibility. So everybody should be in uniform every day. Um, I expect you have logged into Talon and you reviewed the PowerPoint lecture material. You already kind of know where we're going with the day and what we're gonna be doing. So you're not clueless as to what we're gonna be trying to accomplish that day. Um, bring your mask and the full uniform. Um, this semester masks are required all across campus, both in buildings, um, in the hallways, in the bathrooms, wherever you happen to be. Uh, plus your uniform is expected. And we wear gloves in the kitchen all the time anyway, so wearing gloves is always a good practice. Bring your basic toolkit. And I say the basics. Um, we won't be doing any cake decorating in this class, so you probably don't need to bring every tool in your toolkit. It's a lot to haul along. Bring along the basic tools that you'll need. Things like your rubber spatula, your whisk, um, offset spatulas, uh, your bench scraper, some of, those, some of those basic tools that we would need on a daily basis in a bakery. Expect to work in the lab every day. Uh, we are going to be actually, you know, making something every single day we're in the lab. So because of that, um, be prepared just to come and work and make some, make some good product and be able to uh, look it over, evaluate it, and also compare it with other classmates around the room. The daily lecture and lab prep are located on talent. So uh, we won't be doing that in the lab, we won't be doing any lectures. We're gonna be doing strictly lab work and um, focused on the product. So make logging into talent a daily routine. Make it something that you do every single day. If you don't like doing it early in the morning before class, then do it in the afternoon or evening to get ready for the next day. Now, of course, I can be reached as well as all of your classmates in Talon under the communications tab but I'll also give you some detailed information in the uh, syllabus about how to contact me by phone, by email, by text message, and by uh, um, Facebook and Instagram, if, if you like, as well. So here's my contact information. Uh, my office is right across the hall from the bakery in 180Q. Um, I do carry office hours at this time of the semester, but they're really limited, so it's really early in the morning or it's after five o'clock in the evening. Here's my email address and my office phone. Um, of course, when I'm in the lab, I'm not available in my office. Uh, you'll just get voicemail, so you can always text me on my cell phone. Um, here's my Instagram and Facebook as well. You can always find me there. I will be uh, checking these things every day and uh, throughout the morning and throughout the day. Uh, I also post pictures of what we do in class on Instagram and Facebook nearly every day. So you can keep up with what's going on and what pictures I've taken um, of the work. Now, when it comes to lab log forms, these are documentation of the planning, execution, and findings of a day of experimentation in the bakery. So really, we're gonna document what we do. What did we intend to do? What was our experiment based on? Um, what did we expect as an outcome? And then did we actually get what we expected or did we get a surprise? Uh, and what was that surprise and why did that happen? So accurate reporting fosters the understanding of experiments and tests to give baked products, uh, or given to get baked products, ingredients and processes. So really what it comes down to is that if we don't document it, it's just an accident and it gets forgotten. Uh, the best thing to do is to write things down and remember why things happen. Um, they are worth quite a bit of points. The so lab reports are worth 40 points a day. Um, you'll generate those so that uh, you not only not only earn points and earn your grades, but but you know really when it comes down to it, I try not to worry too much about grades. I really focus more on what I'm learning. Uh, when I was a student in baking school, that was what I was focused on. I was just focused on learning material, and what I found was that you know if I focus on the learning, focus focus on what I wanted to understand. I got good grades no matter what, um, and you will too. So each day you'll generate one of these lab reports. 
and they'll be collected at the end of class. So using talent in the science of baking, um, we've used talent for a lot of years since it first was introduced. We had an older system before that. Um, it wasn't nearly as, nearly as nice as Talon, but um, it'll be used to enhance the course. Remember, this, this course is really focused on the lab as much as anything. The lecture part is important, um, but the lab is really a place where we can apply what we learn in lecture. So all PowerPoint files are available under course content and the day number that's listed there. Um, all quizzes will be taken on Talon. I have uh, three, three quizzes, I believe, I mean, three quizzes that are on talent. And those are groups based on content. So usually you take a quiz uh, shortly after we've covered it in class. So it's still fresh in your mind. Um, communication and talent um, is something we can do between, students can, you, know, you guys can talk between yourselves on, on, on talent or you can be able to send messages to me. Um, you can send out uh, a blanket communication email to everybody if you like. Um, and any discussion questions and lab log submissions can be done right in talent. Um, if you are in the process of writing a lab log during lab and we run out of time and you haven't finished it, you can always finish it up later and photograph it with your, with your phone and upload the photograph to talent or email it to me and I'll be able to give you credit for it. All right, so attendance. Um, this semester, we're, we're in a very unique situation. Um, this class meets for 16 days. Typically, uh, if you miss more than 10% of a lab class, um, then you will fail the class. Um, if you know you'll need to be absent from class, contact me. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen this semester when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we don't know uh, how, how that will affect us. Um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is, uh, has created a, a very unique situation for us on campus. So like I say, we'll be wearing masks. Um, during time, we're working closely together, like at the disk station, we'll be uh, wearing face, face shields as well. Um, if anybody in class were to develop symptoms or to test positive for COVID-19, then we would all have to go, te go get tested. And uh, when that happens, if that happens, we would be down for, could be, could be closed down for four or five days until everybody gets their test results back. So it's our responsibility in class, myself included, to do everything we can to be careful outside of class to not allow ourselves to get exposed or get sick. Um, so uh, like, like one person told me, another college, he, he works out in California. He's really worried for his college classes because he says we're only one keg party away from a mass infection. Um, I say, you know, I'm hoping my students won't, won't go to that keg party <laughs> um, or they'll do it virtually or they'll just, uh, you know, have a cold one by themselves. But the idea there is to be responsible. Uh, remember that all it takes is one of us to get infected and we could all end up being out of class for a week or more. Could end up canceling the whole class if that, if that came up. Um, if you were to miss class, um, you'll initially re receive a zero for the day. Um, I can issue a makeup assignment uh, with a deadline for completion if needed. If you complete a makeup assignment, you'll be able to continue in the course and any penalty points will be removed. And if you uh, don't hand in a makeup assignment, then you'll just, you'll just receive a zero for that day. Um, if you don't call, if you're a no-show, just a no-call, no-show, then I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. Um, it's very much like if you were working somewhere and you just didn't show up for work. Uh, your boss wouldn't have a lot of sympathy for you. Um, but let me know what's going on. You know, if you uh, think you have been exposed to COVID-19 or you start having symptoms or you feel ill, uh, of course we don't want you to come to class. Um, and I'm gonna be offering a lot more excused absences this semester than I normally would because obviously um, any one of us could get sick this semester and uh, we just don't know what how the semester will go. So we're gonna just do our best uh, to work as best together when it comes to this, uh, when it comes to attendance, when it comes to um, keeping
keeping everybody healthy. So all of that aside, um, in science of baking, it's going to be very important that we have ac accurate measurements. Um, and as much as it seems like, well, it's just a matter of measuring something, it's not any big problem. Uh, exact measurements and careful scaling of ingredients is no joke in baking. If you have something mismeasured, obviously the product is going to come out dramatically different than you expected, um, which means that the experiment, that whatever we were trying to do, um, doesn't work because now the, in, the ingredients weren't measured correctly. So everything in baking relies on the proportion of ingredients uh, one to another. So how much flour compared to water, how much flour and water compared to fat, and so forth. Uh, all the ingredients matter in baking. So uh, what we're going to do to make sure of that is we're going to weigh everything. Um, we don't even think about using a cup measurement. We just measure everything by weight. That way everything is always the same. Um, so we can be absolutely sure that we're not uh, tainting the experiment with in inaccurate measurements. So in order to compare two things, we have to we have to be able to uh, be sure that they were um, that they were under the same conditions. So measurements of ingredients are part of it, but then and that includes ingredients, but then that also includes the temperature of those ingredients. Um, eggs fresh out of the refrigerator are cold. Um, if we add something cold to one batch, but then we have room temperature eggs in the other batch, that could affect how it mixes and it could affect the outcome of the product. It also includes oven temperature. So all products that are being compared would need to be baked in the same oven to make sure they're getting the same conditions when they're being baked. So know your units of measurement and how to calculate conversions. If you get confused about measurement conversions, ask just ask we'll put it up on the board uh or i'll work with you one-on-one -on -one so we can get your we can do the math correctly um not everybody is a natural when it comes to math so uh it's it's one of those things that all bakers eventually have to learn but at the same time um if you're feeling like okay i'm not sure about my measurements here i'm not sure about my conversions check you know you could either check with another classmate or if you're worried that you'll both be wrong check with me i'll make sure that uh, we check the measurements and get them right. I mentioned the baking methods. Um, in cooking, there are some main cooking methods, some classic cooking methods. There's saute, braise, roast, poach, and grilling. Um, each method has an important effect on the product outcome. So something that should be, let's say, roasted, um, like a chicken, for example, if you were to then saute that chicken, you're going to get a very different product, a very different result. So see, it'll still be edible, but it may not be exactly as you wanted it to be. Um, baking methods are very similar. We have creaming method, foaming method, pre-cooking method, the cut-in method, and lamination. Um, these methods are intentionally created to uh, get products mixed correctly uh, because the Oven as our, our basic uh, method of, of preparing a product or finishing a product. That will, um, these, these methods are based on mixing, as you can see. So each baking method and different technique um, of using each of them, these greatly affects the product outcome. If something is improperly applied, if you are trying to cream some sugar and some soft butter together and you cream one example for three minutes and you do for five minutes on the other, you're going to probably get to two different outcomes because the method of mixing makes a big difference. It could mean that the product is inaccurate, uh, unsellable, un inedible even. Um, so we're going to strive our best in this class to do as much, cons be as consistent as we possibly can. So measurement control in the scientific method um, when we come to the scientific method, it's used in all science classes. If you ever take, took biology or chemistry, they talk about the scientific method. And one of the most important aspects of the scientific method is to control things that uh, could happen to your experiment. Um, we refer to these as variables. These are things that influence the outcome of an experiment. 
we usually start with a hypothesis. And from a an hypothesis, we then develop an experiment or a series of experiments. And then after experiments, we start to draw some conclusions based on what we find out in those experiments. The scientific method has been used for several hundred years, and it is foolproof. Uh, but in order to make that happen, we have to make sure that we control those variables. Uh, what are those variables? Well, these are things that um, are going to affect our product. So scaling of ingredients, ingredient temperature, oven temperature, the humidity in the room, mixing method, and consistency of technique are all variables that can affect the outcome of the product. So if we do things differently in two batches, we'll end up with two very different products, regardless of what we were trying to test for. When we conduct an experiment, um, we're testing a very narrow element of a recipe. So it might just be the mixing method. It might be um, using uh, slightly different ingredients. It might be using a different leavener, like a different one. It could be baking powder versus baking soda. It could be uh, any one of a number of things that we're, we're testing. We cannot observe product outcomes unless we control all other reasonable variables and keep them from ruining the experiment. If for some reason we end up with a uh, uh, some, some really different really different mixing methods um, and are not done accurately, obviously uh, the experiment uh, would have to be started over. We just have to start over because the experiment that we were attending is no longer valid. All right, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break and just give ourselves a chance to uh, get ready for the rest of this PowerPoint. The rest of this PowerPoint is dealing with chapter one primarily and chapter two. Um, and you'll see this first slide come up here that has the formula, uh, scale capacity, scales and scale, okay, scale really readability. Um, differences between weight and fluid ounces, density, viscosity, baker's percentage, um, and tempering of products. So uh, we'll talk about that in just a little while. Okay, so let's start talking about the importance of accuracy. We'll see some keywords for the chapter right here um, that are going to be our focus for this uh, half of the PowerPoint, but uh, the importance of accuracy. You know, most baked products are all made of the same ingredients, and unlike the kitchen chefs or the chefs on the savory side of the kitchen, we bakers pretty much make nearly everything from five main ingredient groups. Mostly that's like flour and grains, sugars, fats, liquids, and uh, Finally, in, in many cases, leaveners. Uh, we just have a, a few ingredients to work with and just different combinations of those. So when it comes to uh, our ingredients, if we make one small change, it can make a huge difference. Because of that, we really have to focus on our scales. And we have two main types of scales for weighing things. We have a, a baker's balance scale, which is called a beam scale. And we have digital electronic scales. There's also a third type of scale called a spring scale, which basically operates uh, as a result of a metal spring. Uh, different types of scales are, have different levels of accuracy and precision. But uh, the most important thing is that we take good care of our scales so that they don't get damaged, because if they're damaged, they're not going to have nearly as much accuracy. So here's a digital scale. You've got to check that your scale works. Um, you can do that with a known weight. Uh, in this case, in the photograph, you can see a, uh, it's actually a calibration weight they're using to, to test the scale to make sure it weighs accurately. We can also use some of those in our lab, but we can also use other things that are, uh, that are well known to have a certain weight. One of the things I use is a pound of butter. I'll put a pound of butter, which uh, one thing you can count on is that butter is almost absolutely sure to be 16 ounces in one pound. They make sure of that because if they sell a little less, then people feel they're being cheated. If they sell a little bit more, they're losing money. So I'll, I'll try to take something I know the weight of and I'll put it on the scale 
and then I'll go ahead and, and zero out the scale and then try weighing it again. And if I get the same reading repeatedly, I know the scale is, is at least working correctly and it's properly calibrated. So you should know what your scale's capacity is. What's the maximum that it can weigh? Every scale has a little sticker on it, or it'll have some sort of engraving in it that'll tell you exactly what the scale can handle as far as its maximum. It also tells about the readability, the smallest weight that can be read um, on the display panel. So that might be, it might show, uh, let's say, uh, six pounds as the maximum, and it'll say times 0 0.1, which an uh, ounces. So what they'll say is that, okay, it'll read as small as one-tenth of an ounce. Um, it's important to know what those are. So here's an example of 100 ounces times 0.1 ounces, or four kilograms, and the uh, D means the smallest readability would be five gram increments. So it won't read one gram, it'll read in five gram increments. So there's the maximum, and there's the minimum. Just important to know so you know what you're, how you're weighing things. So the readability of a scale is not the smallest amount the scale can weigh accurately. Uh, you know, if I put one gram on a scale, sometimes, uh, in most cases, scales have a difficult time reading the smallest quantity, and it's sometimes hard to uh, get accurate, real, real accurate readings. So sometimes I will put a small quantity of something in a container that weighs a little bit more. Uh, I'll take, let's say, a one pound container, put it on the scale, zero out the scale, and then I'll put one gram or two grams of something into that container. That way I get more into what I call the sweet spot of my scale. With digital electronic scales, they're very, very sensitive. Um, you want to keep them away from induction burners. Um, Keep them away from strong breezes and vibrations. If someone's banging things around, obviously you're not going to get nearly as much of an accurate reading <clears throat> as you could if you were in a, in a more stable environment. And it really doesn't matter, measure, or matter whether you're measuring metric or whether you're me measuring U.S. common units. The reality is, is that weight is weight. So uh, it's just important that you weigh exactly for the kind of units that the recipe calls for. So if the recipe calls for ounces, then you measure in ounces. If you need to measure in grams, that's not a problem. You could convert grams to ounces, which is a simple calculation. But you can also just switch the scale over to gram units and then just follow the directions. So why do people use metric? Well, the reality is the rest of the world uses metric. The United States and uh, the UK or England are the only countries left that are not using metric system. And even most people in the, in the UK use the metric system because that's primarily what's used throughout Europe. It's said to be more accurate. Um, really, when it comes down to it, it's not more accurate. It really is just that one gram is a very small, small measurement. So in a typical ounce, you have 28.35 grams, which means you can zero in on a very, very close measurement um, with, with grams. Um, a, a digital scale will give you just as accurate a measurement in ounces as it will in, in grams. It's just that a lot of people are using grams partly because the math is easier when you try to convert recipes to a larger size or a smaller size because everything is measured in scales of 10. It makes the math easier. So. The difference between volume and weight is really important because different products have different densities, they have different, um, different qualities, and we can't accurately measure dry ingredients by volume. So a cup of flour, we never use that. We'll never use it in the bakery. Um, if a recipe calls for a cup of flour, then we'll convert that to a weight measurement. And uh, I have a book that I keep around the classroom, and I use it all the time to help convert cup measurements into weights. Um, it's important for consistency, it's important for accuracy, and uh, I think cup measurements are something that uh, our grandmothers used, but we won't be using in the future. Professional bakers never use cups for anything. 
So liquids are sometimes measured in volume by cups, for example, but even that can, can uh, lead to inaccu inaccurate measurements. So the only way you can accurately measure uh, liquids by volume is if, you, if there are known quantities. So things like water, water is always uh, exactly the same in volume as it is in weight. So eight ounces, eight fluid ounces of water is equal to eight, flu eight ounces on the scale. There's an old saying that a, uh, that uh, a uh, what is it? <laughs> old saying that a, a pound the world round. A pound. Uh, I'll think of it. I'll think of it. Anyway, um, sixteen fluid ounces weighs sixteen ounces in weight in weight when it comes to water and things like water. So milk. Uh, generally cream, uh, fluid eggs, um, also apple juice, orange juice, things like that generally weigh the same as they, as they measure in volume. Uh, but other liquids we can't count on. Things like, um, uh, things like uh, corn syrup, uh, vegetable oil, those are things that have different densities than water and we can't count on that. A corn syrup, for example, weighs 11 and a half ounces per cup. That is a lot heavier than eight ounces. And vegetable oil weighs about seven and a half ounces per cup, which is lighter than water. That's why oil floats on top of water. So we can't count on those things. It's best just to weigh them. And that's why most of our recipes will be listed as weights. So don't confuse you know, weight and volume. Um, they are not the same. Um, they, you know, 32 ounces, a flour is not a quart of flour, for example. Uh, flour is much lighter than water, and uh, they really can't be counted on at all. So density is a measure of the compactness of particles or molecules. Uh, so how dense is something? Well, flour, for example, all-purpose flour, weighs 4.6 ounces per cup. That's almost half the weight of water. Um, water is eight ounces per cup. So you can see that flour really can't be counted on. If you say it's a cup, it's not eight ounces. It's 4.6 ounces if it's all purpose flour. And different flours weigh different amounts. Um, an example I give here is the corn syrup example, that one cup of water is equal to eight ounces and a cup of corn syrup is 11 and a half. And the illustration is meant to show the density difference between the two. So dense items, uh, dense ingredients, will take up less space than the weight uh, or the, the, than other, other ingredients based on, on their, of the same weight. So basically, uh, you'll see in this illustration flour, water, and oil, um, and, or, or possibly even corn syrup. But which of the above ingredients looks more dense? Which ones are more dense? Well, it all depends on you know, the product that we're putting into a container. If water is of a known density and then we got flour next to it, you'll see that the flour, there's a lot more flour there than there is water, and that's because there's a lot less density in that flour. So the same thing goes for density and thickness. If you take uh, sugar and add it to water, um, it will look like the same amount. A cup, a cup of sugar syrup will look just like water, but it's not. It has sugar in it as well. So what that means then is you have the weight of the water and you have the weight of the sugar all packed into one of the same container and it will be just more dense, so then it will weigh more. Now density is a little different than thickness. Um, thickness comes down to uh, the difference in viscosity, so how a particular product flows when it's uh, and the way they measure viscosity is they put a liquid on a slope, a sloped board, and they measure how fast it travels down that sloped board. Thin liquids, the particles or molecules slide past each other easily, so it flows faster. Water is a good example, so it flows very fast. Thicker liquids, like oil or corn syrup or molasses, the more particles are really tightly bound in that 
in that mixture and what happens is the molecules bump and tangle into each other and they can't move as fast. So molasses is thick because the molecules don't slide past each other easily. It's just because they're packed in tighter. Sort of like, the, sort of like when you're driving on the 380 freeway. If you're driving on a 380 freeway at 5 o'clock in the morning, there's very few cars. Everybody's going 70 miles an hour. It would flow very easily. However, in, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it gets much more crowded, and the cars start moving slowly. And the reason why is because it's more, we're more packed in. We're more packed in and tighter. We're more dense. And um, because of that, uh, the freeway can't move nearly as fast. So density and viscosity aren't the same. You cannot judge density of a liquid by its thickness. Just because something's thick doesn't necessarily mean it's dense. So which is more dense, heavy cream or milk? Well, heavy cream is certainly thicker, but is it more dense than whole eggs and orange juice? Well, whole eggs are very thick, but are they dense? Are they more dense than something like orange juice? And then oil and water. Well, water we know is less dense or water is more dense rather than oil because water sinks to the bottom and oil floats to the top. But which one has more thickness? And it's clear that, wa that water um, has less viscosity because it flows faster than oil. So here's a chart to give you an idea of the difference in different products. Approximate weights um, of one pint of various ingredients. And we'll see like Halfway down the chart, you'll see whole milk has a weight of 17 ounces. Uh, heavy cream has a weight of 16.4. So heavy cream is actually lighter than milk. Why? Well, it looks thicker, but it's not as it's not the same density. And the reason why is because cream has so much fat in it that oil, it's actually oil that's that's in a in a um, trapped inside the cream, is lighter and less dense than all the water, the high water content of whole milk. Whole milk only has 4% fat. Heavy cream has 36% fat. So these differences can make a difference in how liquids and how other products are, uh, their, their, their behavior and their, their qualities. Honey, molasses, and glucose corn syrups down at the bottom of the chart are 23 ounces per pint. And you can see that that is significantly th uh, heavier and it says approximate weight for half a liter approximate weight for half for a pint so it's 23 ounces per pint that's very heavy compared to let's say water which is only 16.7 and if you look at the chart you'll be able to see that there's quite a few other differences sifted flour versus unsifted flour this is one of the main reasons why whey flour because if it's sifted it has more air trapped in it uh, between the particles unsifted flour is a little heavier because it's more dense because it hasn't been aerated. So let's get to the math a little bit. Um, let's talk about baker's percentage. We weigh things in baking because we want to be consistent. Um, in order to calculate different batch sizes of different products, we need to make sure that we're doing the math correctly. And bakers have a special way of doing that. It's a formula based on percentages. Now, most of us haven't dealt with percentages since many years ago when we were fifth or sixth grade. So it's a little bit hard to understand at first, but once you start getting the idea that basically what we're talking about with a percentage is that every ingredient that's in a baked uh, product recipe is all based on the flour. Um, the flour weight is what we start with. And we call the flour weight on flour weight basis. So we basically call the flour 100%. And we give we just allocate 100% to the flour, and then everything else is a, is basically a fraction or a percentage of that flour weight. So in baker's percentage, it's based on flour weight plus the other ingredients. So the total recipe will be more than 100%. It's not the same as the more commonly used percentage which is based on total batch size being 100%. So that would be something we call all percentage. And that is uh, basically where everything is based on the whole recipe's weight. The whole recipe might be, let's say, three pounds, and the flour would be 
oh, let's say 40% of that whole, whole batch, the whole uh, recipe. In baker's percentage, we use uh, the flour as 100%. Now, why do we do that? Well, we do it so that it can actually, believe it or not, it makes the, it makes the math a little bit easier. The advantage of percentages is that you can more easily compare formulas to one another, but you can also make absolutely sure that the, that the ingredients are in the correct proportions, no matter what size the recipe is. So whether I'm making one pound or I'm making 100 pounds, the amount of each ingredient by a percentage will be the same. And that's, that's what really matters, is the proportion of ingredients. So, when it comes to baker's percentage, you get fewer calculations when changing to the, the amount of one ingredient in a formula. Um, it also makes it easier to calculate the new formula very quickly. Um, and we have to remember why we do it this way. Um, it's something that, after some practice, you can do the math in your head pretty quickly. And uh, that's something that's been around. Baker's percentage has been around for several hundred years. And the reason I think it was invented was because most of the time in the old days, most bakers couldn't read, but they could run the math in their head. Just because someone can't read doesn't mean they're not smart. It just means that they haven't learned how to read. So in the old days, very few, very few bakers um, went to school for very long. They oftentimes, were fa their family ran the bakery and they quit school maybe in the third grade and they went to work in the bakery. And... Uh, never really learned how to read very well. That doesn't mean they weren't smart though, and they were able to figure this out and be able to run the math very quickly. So if we look at this chart, we'll see um, a typical baker's percentage uh, calculation for some brown sugar spice cookies. The flour, pastry flour that's listed, is listed as 100% in the upper right. Then the brown sugar the next ingredient is listed as 50%. But it's 50% of what? Well, 50% of the flour weight. So we see brown sugar is equal to 600 grams, which is half of the flour weight, or 50%, which is 1,200 grams. Now the butter is 500 grams. And uh, we're going to have to list that in a percentage as a percentage of the flour weight. And the way we would do that is we would take 500 grams of butter and divide it by 1,200 and that'll give us a decimal. In this case, it would be 0.4167. That's what we'd get on our calculator. When you convert a uh, recipe, or I mean, convert a percentage, rather, from decimal to, uh, to regular, I guess you could say, we move that decimal point over from being 0.4167, move it over two spots, and we get 41.67%. Uh, the reason why we can move that decimal point two places is because it's just taking the sub substituting, multiplying it by 100. So 500 divided by 1200 would be 0.4167. For the eggs, we have 125 grams divided by 1200 would give us 0.1042 or 10.42 percent. Cinnamon, 20 grams divided by 1200 will give us 0 0.0167. So we've moved that decimal point over two places and get 1.67%. The salt comes out to 0 0.0067 or 0.67%. So it's less than 1% salt. And the total comes up to 154.43%. I know that sounds odd in order to say it's over 100%, but remember, we're using flour as the 100%, so um, everything else is added on to that. Now, when we want to make a baker's percentage recipe, we want to change this recipe amount. Right now, it makes about a little over five pounds. If we took this recipe and said, well, I don't want five pounds. I want just, let's say, a pound and a half or 24 ounces. I could say, okay, well, my new brown spice sugar cookie recipe is going to be 24 ounces. If I wanted to know how to calculate that, all I'd have to do is change my 154.43% at the bottom and change it back to a decimal. So I'd move my decimal point to the left two places. So I get 1.5443 
and I would say, okay, my new amount will be 24 ounces. So I take 24 and I divide it by the 1.5443. And what I would get is I will get the new flower amount. Now, what that does essentially is we're using a total of percentages to be able to determine what our new 100% would be. If I take, uh, let's see, I'll do that on my calculator here, 24 ounces divided by 1.5443, and I get 15.54 ounces. So to get a new 24 ounce batch, I would need 15.54 ounces of flour. And I could then multiply all of these other ingredients times 15.54 to get the new 24 ounce batch amount. So 15.54 is the flour. If I multiply that times 0.50 for my brown sugar, I'll get 7.77. So basically I could go back down through the whole list, multiplying out each percentage times the 15.54 times the, uh, ounces of flour, and I would end up with a 24 ounce batch. And we know it would be accurate. Even the salt would be absolutely accurate because we know that it's based on a percentage. It's based on something accurate. It's not uh, just guessed, and we don't do it just to taste. So with Baker's percentage, what we're doing is controlling amounts and controlling proportions of ingredients and the measurement of those ingredients. When it comes to controlling temperature, we can control our temperature um, of a lot of our ingredients by deciding when we're going to pull them out of the refrigerator, um, we can heat them if necessary. Um, we can do what we have to do to make sure our ingredients are a temperature that's stable and that works for our recipe. In some cases, cold ingredients right out of the refrigerator are perfectly fine, but other times we need to have our ingredients at room temperature. Um, it all depends on the, on the recipe, but um, for example, butter. Refrigerated butter is rock hard. Butter that's been allowed to sit out and get to room temperature is much softer. And for some, for some recipes, it's important to have the butter uh, soft and uh, pliable. Then there's the word tempering. Um, there are many times we have to control temperature through tempering. And what that means is to carefully combine ingredients that are widely different temperatures. So let's say we need to incorporate eggs in with some boiling hot milk. In order to do, to do that, if I just pour the hot milk in with cold eggs, or even room temperature eggs, it will start to cook the eggs. That's not good necessarily. We don't want scrambled eggs. So what we end up doing is tempering the two together. We'll pour a little bit of the hot milk into the eggs, whisking them together until the eggs slowly start to warm. And then we'll take that egg and milk mixture and whisk it back into the pot of hot milk, thereby tempering the two together. I'll demonstrate this in class, but basically what it comes down to is the eggs are very temperature sensitive and in order to keep those eggs from cooking too quickly we use the tempering technique in order to make sure that they don't cook faster than they should. Another example is gelatin which is very temperature sensitive and it's combined oftentimes with very cold ingredients. If it's combined all of a sudden or all at once it will it will gel and create lumps. Lumps that we don't want so we use the tempering technique to help incorporate those widely different temperatures. Of course, we can control our oven temperature as well. Um, one of the ways we can do that is to obviously use, use the dial and make sure it's set to the correct temperature for the recipe. But the other thing is that um, we can preheat the oven in advance to make sure the oven is well uh, stabilized. It's had a chance to come up to temperature. It's had a chance to go down and up a couple of times. The oven has had time to really stabilize. That's important to make sure that the oven is not on the, on, in the process of heating while we put our product into the oven. And then avoid opening the oven door if we can possibly help it during baking. I sometimes need to check a baked item in the oven, but I don't need to open the oven all the time over and over, thereby lowering the temperature of the oven. For some products, they don't, they don't come out as good if they're baked at a lower temperature. And the reason why is because they're relying on that high temperature to help them rise or to help them expand and look their best. 
Uh, the picture on this slide shows some puff pastry baked one at a slightly lower temperature and one baked at the proper temperature and you can see the difference in volume. Um, and that's just because puff pastry relies on the water that's in the, in the pastry to get to the boiling point and create steam. If the temperature is not as high, you won't get as much steam, it won't be as active, and then you won't get uh, as, as nice a volume out of your puff pastry. So for class tomorrow, we're going to be starting on Talon with a PowerPoint for day number two. Make sure you wear your uniform to class. We'll be working in the lab and recording your results for the creaming method. We're going to be testing out the creaming method tomorrow. Go ahead and read pages 34 to 44 in the textbook. It'll give you kind of a preview as to uh, how our, the author of our textbook is uh, approaching um, some of these concepts. And access talent to review the recipes for the day. I'll bring in fresh recipes printed for you. Um, if you want to print them off yourself, you can, of course, but if you want to save paper, I can print them off for you. So that's it for today. Take a look at uh, the PowerPoint for day two, and I will see you tomorrow.